an hour behind the schedule, so I wish to uh, pick up a little bit of speed uh, here. Uh, next uh, speaker is joining us online from Sweden. Um, Mr. Dan Smith, a director of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, uh, CIPRI. Uh, uh, are you there, Mr. Smith? How are you? Okay, uh, thank you very much for your patience and uh, waiting. I'm not uh, take any more time. I understand uh, uh, your, your subject is uh, common actions connected as one. And uh, uh, you're all set, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of the World Peace Forum for inviting me to be part of this very distinguished panel. I'm sorry, I can't join you in person uh, this time. Um, perhaps on a, on a future occasion, it would be my honor to. What I want to talk about is the way that problems are linked together and therefore action to address those problems need to, needs to be linked which also means that those who are undertaking action need to be joining their work together. The problem that we're facing on a world scale is a compound global crisis and only restricted progress, if any, is really possible on the uh, sustainable development goals unless this compound crisis can be uh, addressed uh, and unless we can start to resolve it. And the crisis is essentially a combination of an in severe environmental de deterioration, uh, especially including climate change, but not uh, only the, the question of climate change, on the one hand, and on the other, a darkening security uh, horizon. 2022 is the year of both insecurity and the year of climate change. If we look at this on the security side first, of course, from a European perspective, we're looking with um, deep concern uh, and no little degree of anger, I must say, at what is happening in Ukraine, at the Russian invasion of Ukraine, at the war that is going on there. There are worries around that in terms of the uh, the use of apparently nuclear threats, or at least what we could call nuclear rhetoric by uh, President Putin and by many other prominent Russians, uh, some on the media, some in politics. Uh, and that I think has also raised concerns. Um, and many people would share the view that President Biden expressed that um, we are closer to nuclear war than we have been since the Cuba Missile Crisis. Having said which, I still don't think that uh, nuclear war or even limited use of nuclear weapons is a probable outcome uh, of what is happening at the moment. But it is nonetheless concerning, obviously, and the, um, the destruction which has been visited upon Ukraine um, is extraordinary. Um, tens of thousands of people, Ukrainian civilians, Ukrainian soldiers and Russian soldiers have been uh, killed. Hundreds of thousands have been uh, forcibly deported. Millions have had to flee as uh, refugees. Uh, the destruction of cities in the southeast, as we've seen in the case of Mariupol, but we are also seeing with other cities as well, is huge. And at the same time now there are the attacks upon civilian infrastructure uh, in Ukraine, completely unwarranted uh, by, by Russia. So from a European perspective, if we're talking about 2022 as the year of insecurity, we think, um, we think Ukraine. And uh, obviously Ukraine has been also uh, important in the perspective in Northeast Asia as well, but perhaps uh, in Northeast Asia, you're also thinking uh, somewhat more about Taiwan and the crisis over Taiwan, as if it was not bad enough for there to be um, the, the crisis over and the war in Ukraine. Uh, there is also the crisis over Taiwan and the possibility that there could be uh, military action there as well. Um, and then closer to home for you, of course, on the Korean Peninsula, there are the missile tests by, the, uh, by, by North Korea and the possibility that has been raised of the first nuclear weapons test 
for some six years. Elsewhere in the world, as part of this year of insecurity, there are more than 50 other wars going on. Perhaps the largest of them, and the one that has got the most attention so far, is Ethiopia, which is partly an intra-state war within Ethiopia, but which also has the involvement of Eritrea coming across the border, so it's an international war as well. As the context to all of this, and in a way to, you could almost say, like take the temperature of the world, it's worth looking at some of the more background issues that have been developing in the lead up to this year. So in 2021, for the first time ever, world military spending passed the total of two trillion US dollars. That is more than it has ever been, more than it was at the height of the Cold War. At the end of the Cold War, world military spending was about 1.5 trillion. By the end of the 1990s, it had come down to a little above 1 trillion US dollars. In the past 20 plus years, it has almost doubled. The number of refugees in the world doubled from 2010 to 2020. And the second uh, decade of this century, since 2010 to 2020, saw twice as many people killed in war as were killed um, in the first decade of this century through war. So the year of insecurity as we now experience it is not necessarily the culmination uh, of trends that have been unfolding for some period of time because we don't know whether those trends are going to develop further. We don't know if we have reached the end of the trend line of increasing risk. But what we can see is that there is a long-term process that has been generating increased insecurity and risk in the world. And this is part of the compound crisis that we now face. So moving to the other side of it then, to the environmental side, Yes, this is the year of insecurity, this is the year of war, but this is also, in case anybody forgets, the year of climate change. This is the year of the uh, worst drought on record in China. This is the year of a once in 500 years drought in Europe. This is the year of one third of Pakistan being submerged under floods. This is the year when the, uh, in the Horn of Africa, those areas which have not been flooded have been suffering for a long drought. As far as climate change is concerned, there is absolutely no room for any doubt whatsoever. Um, climate change, global warming is happening, it is causing climate change, and global warming is caused by human activity. 19 of the uh, 20 hottest years uh, in world, in recorded history, have um, occurred since the beginning of this century. 19 of the 20 hottest since 2000. 29 of the 30 hottest have occurred since 1990, and 38 of the 40 hottest have occurred since 1980. In other words, each decade is warmer than the previous one. And as this year shows, we are well on course that this decade will be warmer than the second decade of this century, which already broke all records. The latest reports from the United Nations are saying that the opportunity to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels is almost gone. And the opportunity to keep uh, warming below two degrees is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and requiring ever more radical action to meet. At the same time, and not unconnected to climate change and to, to global warming, the crisis of air pollution is getting worse. The annual death toll from outdoor air pollution is now four and a half million people a year. And not to belittle the um, tragedy of war in, uh, in Ukraine or in Ethiopia or earlier the uh, few years back when it was at its height, the war in Syria, but a death toll of 4.5 million is considerably above the death tolls of those wars. Some 
10 to 12 times more. And then if we're talking about death toll, we can talk about the COVID-19 pandemic, which is also, if not itself exactly a result of environmental de deterioration, it is the kind of pandemic which could be the result of environmental deterioration. And it shows us the scale of risks that we face. The official death toll is six and a half million people so far. And that is very high, higher than the air pollution death toll that I just mentioned. But the World Health Organization has used a model including uh, excess mortality to estimate that the true death toll may be 15 million. And The Economist magazine, which is not given to um, spectacular or lavish claims, it has a model which takes into account other factors along with excess mortality, and its estimate is 23 million people dying from the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, all of this is to say that this uh, environmental crisis is itself very deep. It leads to food insecurity, it exacerbates inequality, and it's also, uh, its impact is sharper on those who are at the, the, the poor end of the scale. It, um, it, it deepens inequality. It leads to instability, social instability, as people try to adapt to the pressures from the environmental crisis, especially at the moment, climate change, such as flooding and droughts. The instability can lead to social and political upheaval. It sharpens disputes, and it can lead to conflict, including violent conflict. So let's try to get a sense of the interconnection between these two crises, the crisis of environment and the crisis of peace. The environmental crisis leads to instability, as I was just saying. What, ha what is happening there? If we're to understand the, the crisis of the environment, what we need to understand is that human society, our common life, our lives together, indeed our lives, are based on a functioning biosphere and ecosphere. It is not possible to imagine human society without food, without water, without air. And these are all to do with the, the, the biosphere and the ecosphere. When it is damaged, we are damaged. So what is happening now is that the natural foundations of our social life are being weakened. In countries where you have already poor governance or arbitrary authority, which is not inclined to respond to people's problems, but rather to try to su suppress the problem, suppress the symptom rather than solve it. In those circumstances, instability often simply gets worse, even to the point of violent conflict. When we first started arguing this case 15 to 20 years ago, there are many people, especially in the academy, many scholars who push back, saying, well, there's no evidence. The trouble is that they were looking over their shoulders at the past to try to find the evidence. What we need to understand is that the future that is unfolding is different from the past to which we were, uh, which we were used to, to which we were habituated. And the trouble is, the sad thing is that as the years have gone by over the last 10 to 15 years, the evidence of the linkage between environmental instability and violent conflict has become stronger. It isn't the case that environmental de deterioration always leads to violent conflict. Far from it. People, communities, governments often find ways to handle the problem, but when they don't, then the results can be um, very, very serious, even catastrophic, and include then violent conflict. So you could say that nature doesn't tell you the whole story, but if you leave it out, then you're not telling you the, the whole story. In addition, once violent conflict is going, at a local level, it makes it much harder to handle environmental problems. In fact, environmental governance good management of the natural environment is always one of the casualties of, of, of war. It always suffers. And of course, as we're seeing in uh, Ukraine at the moment, uh, war on a large scale has an enormous environmental impact. 
in addition at the global level confrontation disputation conflict taking sides in different conflicts all make it harder to handle the environmental issues that that we face at a at a at an international level geopolitics has become increasingly toxic increasingly poisonous over the past 10 to 15 years and that geopolitical toxin is poisoning the well of cooperation on which we need to draw if we are to resolve problems like climate change the crisis of air pollution managing the risk of pandemics none of these problems respects national boundaries it is only possible to address them through international cooperation and at the moment the appetite for cooperation is declining so we need to ease the geopolitical situation in order to ease the environmental crisis we need to ease the environmental crisis in order to contribute to a less tense less toxic geopolitics in fact the environment and peace these two questions environment and peace are so connected that you can simply sum it up in a simple formula damage one you damage the other enhance one you enhance the other what this means for the sdg agenda the agenda 2030 for achieving the sustainable development goals is that really action on that agenda in whatever time scale we think requires cooperation the sdgs require sustainable peace the sdgs require a sustainable natural environment and both those two things sustainable peace and a sustainable natural environment require much improved international cooperation in addition because these problems are linked not only do they require integrated approaches by people and institutions who are connecting with each other to do the work they also benefit from integrated solutions there will be a double payoff so i think that there are some principles and some headline recommendations that one can think about here first of all this is a crisis it's an emergency but it's a long-term question so the first thing that we have to do is to understand the need to both think fast and act now and at the same time think ahead we need to cooperate as i've said we also need to be acting and thinking as we go along and be ready to adapt in fact i would make it even stronger than that i would say that we should expect the unexpected we should understand that we are entering uncharted territory in the natural environment we should expect the unexpected and we should be we need to develop a mindset which makes it possible to adapt there is a need clearly for a profound transformation of our economies a transition as it's often called from brown to green when we are making that transition we have to understand that transformation on this scale always produces losers as well as winners so it needs to be well handled it needs to be just so that it is fair to everybody and some people do not suffer for uh, errors and mistakes and accidents and misjudgments that they are not responsible for and it also needs to be managed in a way which is peaceful which is sensitive to the risks of conflict it's a process that should be regarded as being for everyone's benefit and therefore by everyone so linked crises need joint solutions we should be preparing to invest in readiness and resilience in the face of crisis i'm sometimes asked about where the um the resources for this should come from and some and honestly some parts of what one is talking about when thinking about mindsets and so on it's not purely a matter of resources but there will be a need for increased resources being devoted towards these problems we could start in two places we could start by thinking about the two trillion us dollars which is spent on the military and we could also think about the half a billion dollars that is spent every year on sorry half a half a trillion dollars 500 billion dollars spent every year 
on subsidizing the fossil fuel industry and the five and a half to six trillion u s. dollars that according to i m f. and world bank calculations um is spent on indirect subsidies for um for fossil fuel industries that we should be thinking thinking out the ways in which we can finance peace rather than risk and i think that the last point that i want to make here is that therefore what's particularly important is not just to research the issues and the problems and understand them amongst the professionals and the experts though that is important but that in the broader sense we educate ourselves we understand the importance of information and this is a bit of an uphill battle in the era of fake news of course but it is something it is a challenge that we absolutely have to take on everybody needs to understand what is at stake because what is at stake now is not just the national advantage of this or that country what is at stake is our humanity's survival thank you very much for your attention thank you very much mr smith for your superb and uh,